Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Rowley. I am with the NOAA Central Library, and I will be your host today running the technical side. So to get started, a few logistics. As an attendee, you are muted. So if you do have a question, please put that in the question panel, and we will take those at the end of the presentation. If you uh, are having any technical difficulties, as in you can't see the screen or you can't hear the speaker, try logging off and back on. That solves most issues with GoToWebinar. And lastly, we are recording this, so if you do need to step away at any point or if you would like to share this with a colleague, the library will have this posted on its ecosystem-based fisheries management playlist on YouTube. You can find all of our past uh, uh, seminars in this series on that playlist. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peg Brady to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. That's wonderful. We appreciate your help. Uh, Peg Brady from NOAA Fisheries. Uh, welcome to our continuing 2022 EBM, EBFM seminar series. Today we're continuing the series that was initiated by our team back in November 2017. Uh, the main objective have, has always been to increase awareness regarding ecosystem-based management, in this case, ecosystem-based fisheries management, and highlight the progress that NOAA and our partners are making to implement EBFM, and also to better understand the marine ecosystems, ecosystems we work in. Uh, as you can see, uh, NOAA Library continues to be our great co-host for the series, posting these seminars on YouTube. They are this, the seminars are typically held the second Wednesday of each month at three Eastern Standard Time. And each presentation is accessible as Katie uh, just mentioned. Uh, following today, there will be an opportunity to ask questions and Katie will pose those questions to our speaker, John Hare. Um, and so I want to thank all our prior speakers and all the folks that have provided recommendations about our speaker series. Um, it's been great to hear from folks. And I uh, just want to give you a heads up, uh, we uh, will have our next presentation on November 9th. Kevin Craig and Todd Kellison from the Southeast Fisheries Science Center will talk about their ecosystem status reports. Uh, so we'll, we'll not have a speaker in October. So join us on the 9th of November. Um, and today we are so lucky to have John Hare, who is the director of our Northeast Fisheries Science Center based in Woods Hole. He oversees the science activities there and has been deeply involved in ecosystem-based fisheries management for, for many years now. So I want to welcome John to the series today and uh, thank you for preparing this presentation. So I'll turn it right over to you, John. Great, thank you very much, Peg. And thank you, Katie uh, and the NOAA Central Library for hosting this. Uh, today, I'm just, I'm gonna talk about a perspective. I perhaps should have titled this, My Perspective on uh, Moving Forward with Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management. Um, I've never used live polling before, so I've got some live polling uh, in this presentation just to try something different and see if I can learn how to use it. Um, there's two ways to interact with the live polls that are part of this presentation. One, if you have your phone, uh, you can text 22333, but that's the number. And then in the, you know, in what you're texting to that number, it's John Hare 412 and that'll take you to the EV Poll Everywhere account. Um, the other way to do it is in your browser, uh, type in pollev.com backslash John Hare 412, and that will take you into your polls. Um, so there's three slides, three parts of the presentation where we do some live polling, um, and we'll see if it works. If it, if it doesn't work, I will have learned something that I can't do live polling in a presentation. If it does work, we'll sort of have the opportunity to talk about your responses. And I think Katie is going to include that information in the chat uh, just so it's there for anyone to refer to when we get to that part of the presentation. So just an outline of what I want to talk about today. Uh, it's a little bit of history, a little bit of urgency, a little bit of reflection, a little bit of inspiration, and then a little bit on next steps. And the, you know, this idea, you know, how do we implement ecosystem-based fisheries management is still um, somewhat tangled in my mind, like a handful of elvers on the on the right there. Um, and in part by giving this presentation, I, I wanted to, you know, try to try to make some order of this tangle. And so when we're at the end, we'll see 
see how I did. Um, Ecosystem-based fisheries management or ecosystem-based approaches to management is in the NOAA fisheries mission. Uh, mission statement, which is on the web page, second sentence says, we provide vital services for the nation, all backed by sound science and an ecosystem-based approach to management. So it is what we do. Um, I think that's just an important place for us to start from. Um, one can ask, you know, where did this appreciation for an ecosystem-based approach come from? Um, and it came from the very beginnings of NOAA fishery. I have here a picture of Spencer Baird. Uh, in 1871, he came to Woods Hole, uh, the newly formed U.S. Fish Commission director. He came to Woods Hole to understand whether there have been changes in fish abundances in the vicinity of southern New England. Um, so he really came here to understand the dynamics of fisheries. He spent the summer uh, collecting, uh, talking with fishermen, trying to understand the problem through the lens of people who were immersed in it. Um, and he developed 88 questions um, that if he felt that if we could answer these 88 questions, we would have a good understanding of fisheries dynamics in the region. When you look at his questions, he basically outlined an ecosystem-based approach. Uh, he identified the, you know, the importance of the agency of man. Uh, that's not a term that we use much these days, but I, I, I like it. It sounds kind of old fashioned. So agency of man, the impacts of fishing, the impacts of pollution, the impacts of market dynamics on fisheries. He identified we need to understand all life stages and all habitats. He just understood that we need to look at the distribution, the migration and movement of fishes. We need to think about the environmental effects. We need to think about disease. We need to think about parasites. Um, and we need to think about species interactions, the, the predator prey interactions that, that sustain our marine ecosystems. So he laid out uh, very clearly an ecosystem-based approach in 1873 in his first report to Congress. Fast forward 125 years, uh, the Ecosystem Advisory Panel wrote a report to Congress, Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Man Management, um, and they made the statement that a comprehensive ecosystem-based fisheries management approach will require managers to consider all interactions um, that a target fish stock has with predators, competitors, prey species, the effects of weather and climate on fisheries biology and ecology, the complex interactions between fishers, fishes and their habitat, and the effects of fishing on fish stocks and their habitat. So again, laid out, you know, in essence, the program that Spencer Baird laid out uh, using somewhat uh, you know, updated terminology but recognizing that a comprehensive ecosystem-based fisheries management approach is required. Fast forward to 2016, NOAA Fisheries released its ecosystem-based fisheries management policy. Um, Dr. Jason Link, our senior scientist for ecosystems was instrumental uh, in leading this policy for the agency. Um, and it states that NOAA Fisheries strongly supports implementation of ecosystem-based fisheries management to better inform and enable better decisions regarding trade-offs among and between fisheries, aquaculture, protected species, biodiversities, and habitats. So the point here, sort of this quick review of history is ecosystem-based fisheries management, ecosystem approaches to management have been part of the NOAA fisheries mission since the beginning. Um, and so, you know, reading the definition, let's sort of be a little more specific about what we mean. Uh, this definition is from the ecosystem-based fisheries management policy. Um, and it says, EBFM is a systematic approach to fisheries management in a geographically specified area that contributes to the resilience and sustainability of the ecosystem, recognizes the physical, biological, economic, and social interactions among the affected fishery-related components of the ecosystem, including humans, and seeks to optimize benefits among a diverse set of societal goals. So there's a lot in that definition, um, but that is the, the definition that we are using for ecosystem-based fisheries management. 
Now here's the first, you know, poll opportunity, right? Uh, and hopefully you've, you've figured out how to participate. Uh, you can use your internet browser, uh, pollev.com slash johnhair412 and put in your uh, response. Uh, there's also the uh, text that you can use. Um, and so I appreciate people continuing to respond. Um, but we see that when we look at how, you know, we're, we're grading ourselves, um, we're saying that we are marginally or moderately successful in implementing ecosystem-based fisheries management. And so it's been with us for 151 years. We recognize that we need to do it. We have a policy that calls us to do it, um, and we're marginally successful in implementing it. And I think, you know, uh, sort of, you know, rest of my talk is to sort of try to understand you know, why are we only marginally successful or moderately successful in implementing this task that we've known that we've needed to do for 151 years? Um, so again, that's a little history. And now I want to add a little urgency. Um, and I have this, you know, picture here. This is a forest in the Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian. Uh, Hurricane Dorian was that very strong hurricane that came across the Western Atlantic. Uh, many uh, uh, suspect or many think that that hurricane was fueled by climate change. Um, and it's just an example for me of how quickly uh, our ecosystems can change, in this case, change from a, a forest uh, to, you know, uh, a, a bunch of sticks, uh, which will quickly decay uh, and be, uh, you know, detritus for a whole completely different type of ecosystem. I keep this on my phone just to remind myself of the urgency that we are facing. So we are facing an urgent challenge, climate change. Uh, International Panel for Climate Change concluded in their recent uh, summary report for policymakers that global surface temperature will continue to increase until at least mid-century. Um, the way I like to think of this is that, you know, we've baked in the next 30 years of climate change um, and actions that we are considering taking now uh, will determine uh, from 2050 outward, but the next 30 years um, are largely baked in. Uh, we have the temperature in the Gulf of Maine taken from the Northeast Fishery Science Center uh, hydrographic collections, and we see variability. Those are the ups and downs, and then that yellow line is the trend. That trend is the climate change trend. Um, and since 1977, when these observations began, uh, we've seen temperatures in the Gulf of Maine rise by approximately two degrees Celsius. And then this IPCC report tells us that we have another 30 years of warming uh, before there's any you know, probability of sort of changing that trajectory. So you know, we need to adapt how we do management, how we do our science to climate change, because it is going to be the environment in which I'm working for the rest of my career. Um, and for uh, many of you who are also gonna be working for us for the next 30 years. The other urgent uh, factor, external factor that we need to uh, face is offshore wind energy development. Uh, the bottom is a map from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. It shows the states um, that are uh, have wind energy development projects in place or are planning for wind energy development projects. On the East Coast, that kind of bluish green, those are states that have projects. Um, the blue are states that have task force to develop projects. So you see that largely uh, all of the East Coast, except for Georgia, either has projects or are planning projects. On the West Coast, uh, California is really working to develop projects and Oregon is starting their planning efforts. So offshore wind energy development is a national issue. Uh, it's large scale and it's gonna change the nature of our marine ecosystem. And just to give an idea of you know, the, the economic uh, drivers of this industry, uh, six lease areas off of New York uh, in the lease auction uh, raised $4.3 billion for the treasury. Um, so this is for companies to lease an area to then potentially develop uh, offshore wind energy areas. Um, and the third area, just from a very Northeast perspective, but it is uh, relevant nationally, 
um, is we have a number of protected species fisheries interactions, um, which are uh, increasingly uh, becoming critical. Um, the example here, of course, is lobsters and North Atlantic right whale. Uh, you know, we have North Atlantic right whales, one of the most endangered large whale species in the ocean. Um, and we have uh, American lobster fishery, which is one of the most valuable fisheries in the country. Um, and these two uh, components of our ecosystems are in, are in conflict. Um, a seafood group recently red listed lobster um, over sort of how it is working with right and how the risk it's posing to right whales. Um, the courts are involved um, saying the feds, that's NOAA fisheries, are failing to protect endangered white whale, right whales from lobster gear entanglement. So this issue is, is at, at a critical juncture um, and we need to act urgently. And there are components of ecosystem-based fisheries management, ecosystem approaches to management in this conflict. Um, and this conflict between protected species and fisheries is not unique to the Northeast. Um, so next sort of poll event, uh, you know, a little more uh, thought and input than uh, putting in a, a letter grade. Um, are there urgent issues in your region or in your experience that you believe call for an ecosystem approach? Oyster restoration, um, red tides, I'll just read through a couple more of these. Harmful algal blooms, red tides um, are similar. Habitat loss, degradation. Congress, uh, that's a humorous answer. Uh, well, we try to leave politics out of, our, uh, out of our discussion here today. I didn't uh, put that forward at the beginning. Pollux moving into Russia, shifting distributions, offshore wind, forage fish. Um, so, you know, there are a number of other issues um, that are calling for our urgent action uh, that require an ecosystem uh, approach to management. So I think you can keep answering, um, but I'll sort of continue on with the seminar. Pacific salmon abundance, uh, drought and water conflict in the West, certainly. With southern resident killer whales as well, coral bleaching. Thank you. Um, so, you know, trying to sort of instill urgency um, we're marginally to moderately successful in implementing ecosystem-based fisheries management, and we have these urgent issues that require it. Um, so I'm going to talk next about uh, some reflection. Um, so I often feel like, as Northeast Fisheries Science Center Director, that I am a hamster in a wheel. Um, and the faster I run, the faster the wheel turns, and the more likely I am to get hit by something heavy in this picture. It's a desk. Um, so for me, this kind of visualizes uh, what I feel is much of my day to day. Um, and you know, we, I think we all do our best to take the time to, to think strategically and sort of work through issues. And we run the hamster wheel of the day to day. Um, so you know, I've been thinking about EBFM since that 1998 report to Congress. I started working for NOAA Fisheries in 1997, so it was a very timely report for me in my career. Um, but running the hamster wheel, it's, it's difficult to really sit back and think about what you're doing. Uh, you're more just running and trying to avoid that desk. Um, so we had a, you know, a fortunate event, uh, is one way to cast it. In you know, December 2018, January 2019, uh, we had a federal government shutdown for 35 days. Um, you know, enforced, no lab, no office, no computer, no work. Uh, you know, many of our academic colleagues could think of that as a sabbatical. Um, a sabbatical is an extended leave from work, usually tied to an educational or academic goal. So I sort of reframe this in my mind as an enforced extended leave from work um, and tried to sort of tie in an educational or ac academic goal um, and, and thought, you know, just thought I would sort of think through why are we only marginally successful or moderately successful in implementing EBFM? And when I, you know, I thought about my, my job as Northeast Fisheries Science Center Director, there are a number of issues um, and each issue is connected to other issues. And I began to visualize it as a, as a Gordian knot, uh, which is a metaphor for an intractable problem. And I found this graphic and overlaid words on it 
Um, and to me, this, this felt very representative of the challenges that we face in NOAA fisheries, maybe specific for the Northeast, um, but generally applicable to the challenges that we face in NOAA fisheries. You know, that Gordian knot has a name. That Gordian knot uh, was identified in the public policy literature in the early 1970s um, as a wicked problem. It's a nice name. It's got a sort of a ring to it. Um, and it is well defined in the public policy literature. And these problems are difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory, ill defined, and changing requirements. Um, and it's described in this paper. I've got, I've got a reading list at the end of the presentation. This is there too, but dilemmas in a general theory of planning uh, by Hortle, uh, Horst Riddle. And I do want to acknowledge John Manderson and Peter Corcoran. Um, you know, they both worked for the Northeast Fishery Science Center, uh, you know, at the time that I was beginning to think about wicked problems, uh, introduced me to the concept um, and really sort of, we had very engaging conversations around this concept of wicked problems and the types of problems that we face in NOAA fisheries. So thank you, John, and thank you, Peter. So a very excellent paper um, written by DeFries and Nagendra in 2017 in science, uh, it's, it's relatively short. Um, and they took this wicked problem concept and, and sort of mapped it out to ecosystem management. And they, you know, they, they, the title of the paper, Ecosystem Management as a Wicked Problem. And they you know, went through the construct, you know, wicked problem, difficult to solve, contradictory information, not enough information, sort of changing uh, landscape. And they identified two traps. Um, and I, you know, I think of these as wicked problem traps. One trap is inaction from overwhelming complexity. Um, and to me, this is let's just keep doing what we're doing because we know how to do it. Um, it's an Escher diagram on the right at the top where uh, everybody continues to walk upstairs and manage to walk in a circle at the same time. Um, the second trap, which they identified, is falsely assuming that there's a tame solution. Um, and I sort of think of this as a one ring to rule them all. Um, we're all looking for that one solution to solve our ecosystem-based fisheries management problem. Um, and so, you know, thinking about, you know, some examples from my experience of these two traps, um, you know, our single species stock assessment is in essence, you know, continuing to do things because it's the way we've done them in the past. And this isn't fair. Um, single species stock assessments are very useful in, in particular sets of problems um, where, the, you know, the issue set is somewhat bound um, and where fishing is a very important factor. So I'm not saying that they are, uh, you know, that we need to move 100% away from single species stock assessments, but I do see the, our sort of uh, attachment to them is in part because we know how to do them. Second example is we really have a difficult time incorporating paradigm shifts into our science and management. Um, again, you know, the example here, uh, 2010, North Atlantic right whale started to decline. Um, and, you know, communicating that science um, through the agency to our partners um, and sort of uh, having the community recognize that North Atlantic right whales were in decline was a difficult situation. Um, and there really was sort of a, it was hard to change the paradigm that North Atlantic right whales were recovering to this understanding that North Atlantic right whales were recovering and are now decreasing. Um, and that's, those are two examples of that first trap. Um, the second trap is, you know, there's gotta be one solution out there that will solve all our problems. Um, there are a number of papers written about ecosystem-based management and they will sort of make the claim towards the end that we need new laws to give us new governance structures to do ecosystem-based management. It's sort of that, uh, you know, there's one solution out there, we don't have it yet, and we need new laws to tell us what it is. Um, and then the other, you know, example is this, you know, that this search for one approach that changes how we do things and solves our biggest problems. So I see these, you know, in, in my work life as examples of those two traps 
um, and, and framing them as traps as, uh, as examples to avoid. Um, the other piece which came you know, during this sort of reflective period when I wasn't, when we weren't able to work, um, is I, you know, there's this cultural component of how we do science. Um, you know, I, we traditionally have done science where the science are the experts. Uh, we try to sort of separate science from external influences. Uh, we, we pass a problem to the scientists. The scientists work, uh, come up with solutions and answers, and then pass the problem back uh, to the people asking the questions, call them managers. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting to think about that, you know, this is sort of the, the way that we do things, uh, but that is very much the culture of how we do things. And that culture is reflective of a public policy approach, which grew out of World War II called the rational comprehensive approach. You know, give your tough problems to experts. Those experts can then use their expertise to come up with solutions and then provide answers back to the ones asking the question. And this is also a component of, of the wicked problem concept. This is wicked problems. The idea is, is that um, there's this another public policy model which is better suited for addressing wicked problems. And that model is called an incremental approach or a participatory approach. There's a little cartoon on the right. I'm not gonna go through all the components of this, um, but the, you know, the heart of this approach from a scientific perspective is that scientists don't provide solutions in isolation. Um, scientists work with others in defining the problem, developing the processes to address the problem, and then identifying options and solutions. And so in this, in this incremental approach framework or participatory approach framework, science is one one perspective on the problem, but not the only perspective. And all perspectives are valued and used to help solve the problem. Um, scientists provide their, their expertise, um, but other stakeholders and, and participants also provide their expertise. Um, so as it, for me, it was enlightening to realize that you know, I had trained as a scientist in one culture, a rational, comprehensive approach to public policy making, without recognizing that there are other alternative models out there. So it was re revelatory for me to read about this incremental approach and to think about how to use it to apply it to the problems um, that I was facing. And so uh, I wrote a, a perspective, a, a pr perspective piece in the ICES Journal of Marine Science. Uh, 10 Lessons from the Front Lines of Science in Support of Fisheries Management. Um, you know, the reviewers were very right to point out that there was nothing new in what I had written. Um, this ground had been covered before. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom in 2009, uh, Ludwig et al. in 1993, Holling and Meffy in 1996. Um, but, you know, one, for, for I think I was able to add a perspective of someone who's in the midst of these wicked problems from the front lines. Um, and second, it's an ex, you know, sort of an exemplary that we still need to do work to take this incremental approach to heart um, that we're still sort of struggling with how to address these problems in 2018 when it's sort of these ideas were laid out in 1973, 1993, 2009. Um, so uh, you know, I, I wrote out 10 lessons for myself. I'm a, a big fan of the, you know, David Letterman, his uh, late night show, he used to have his top 10 list. So I, I made up a top 10 lessons for myself as to how to address these problems. Um, one, accept that fisheries are complex socio-ecological systems, explicitly acknowledging humans are part of the ecosystem. Two, strengthen existing adaptive management processes and institutions. Three, encourage and engage in participatory science and co-learning. Four, question inertia. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you, you stop inertia, but it's always good to just sort of question inertia. Uh, five, respect all perspectives. Six, recognize fishers as knowledge experts. Seven, always consider the scale of the problem. Eight, be open to changing your mind and adjusting your perspective. Nine, read, listen, and discuss broadly, one of the reasons why I'm giving the seminar. And 10, 
publish and communicate the results of science and management. One of the reasons why I wrote that perspective piece. So, you know, just to summarize my reflective period, um, you know, we, we know we need to take ecosystem approaches. I think they are clearly fall into the category of wicked problems. Um, so we should work to avoid the traps that have been identified. Um, we should work to apply the lessons that we learn. Um, and we should take incremental steps, uh, sort of learning from that incremental approach to public policy. But now, a little inspiration. Uh, and these are going to go fast. Um, this idea of incremental steps. You know, uh, Peg, I'm sure that this seminar series is full of incremental steps towards ecosystem-based fisheries management or ecosystem approaches to management. I just want to celebrate a few more. We have adaptive management structures and processes that we can use. Uh, the fisheries management process is iterative and participatory. Uh, the Magnuson-Stevens Act is a remarkable law. Uh, it, it has stakeholders making decisions informed by science um, and being sort of then processed by the federal government. It's, it, the more I learn about it, the more amazed I am by the structure of it. Um, and you know, the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council has been taking this incremental approach. Uh, they've got a Mid-Atlantic ecosystem approach, and there's a, a great GitHub presentation with Sarah Geitches and others from the Science Center that present it. Um, but you know, the Fisheries Management Council, the Marine Fisheries Commissions are iterative and participatory, so have many of the elements that we can use. Um, we do effectively engage in participatory processes to define questions and develop options. Example here is East Coast uh, climate change scenario planning effort, which is underway right now. It's led by the councils and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and NOAA Fisheries. Um, and it's a participatory structured process to think about how our fisheries management can adapt to climate change going forward. And it, yes, it takes time, um, but it is participatory and directly in line with this incremental approach. Uh, third one is we have robust cooperative research programs to support participatory science. Uh, this week, uh, yesterday, I spoke at the National Cooperative Research Program annual meeting um, with representatives from each of the science centers around the country. Um, so we have uh, uh, cooperative industry members that are directly engaged in our science and really support this idea of participatory science and participatory management. Um, we continue to develop participatory science and management activities. The example here is a, a Atlantic Caring Management Strategy Evaluation, uh, New England Fisheries Management Council, Northeast Fisheries Science Center scientists, John Deroba led for the center, um, and then council staff and regional office staff. Uh, you know, produced two papers, um, one looking at the process Again, going to, to lesson number 10, we need to be publishing both the science and our successful processes. And then the second one is a science paper that sort of discusses the modeling. Um, and this led to a change to the harvest control rule for Atlantic herring. So we can see this moving towards uh, and into management decisions. Another example is we produce ecosystem status reports for most of the large marine ecosystems of the United States. Uh, we heard that in November, we're going to hear about the Southeast uh, Ecosystem Status Report. These are based on decades of data collection by NOAA Fisheries and others that present sort of the, the past and present status of our ecosystem as a, as a baseline for us to work from. Another inspiration, um, you know, we have a question inertia and made changes to how we assess and manage. The example here is uh, the development of a multi-species model for Atlantic Menhaden uh, and striped bass management. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation called this a groundbreaking change to Menhaden fisheries management. Um, and the, the scientists and managers and policymakers involved in this uh, you know, wrote a paper in Frontiers to Marine Science to document you know, the process that they went through to get to this groundbreaking change. Another sort of science uh, questioning of inertia and really making progress um, is the development of a state-based assessment model. Uh, Tim Miller 
uh, working with others, including Brian Stock. It's the Woods Hole Assessment Model. It's a state-based assessment model that incorporates time-varying processes and age-varying processes, like environmental covariance. So this model is structured to accept uh, you, you know, changing environmental conditions into the population model. Um, and currently at the Northeast Fishery Science Center, uh, we have a, a research track assessment underway that is evaluating the application of this model um, in our stock assessment processes. Um, so, you know, we have many of the pieces of an ecosystem approach. Um, I, I think one, one task is we need to continue to bring those pieces together. As an example, uh, John Kosick, Jason Link, and I uh, wrote a, a paper in fisheries that laid out Atlantic salmon recovery and mapped it onto the ecosystem-based fisheries management definition. Um, and you know, all the pieces of that ecosystem-based fisheries management definition are in uh, our Atlantic salmon recovery activities. And I imagine if we were to map uh, our sort of species-focused management or our topic-focused management onto that ecosystem-based fisheries management definition, uh, we would recognize that we're making much more progress than we think we are. Um, and we need to just continue to bring the pieces together and present them uh, in an ecosystem frame. Another area of inspiration is our management partners can work collectively at large ecosystem scales. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council and the New England Council both set up deep sea coral protection areas. Uh, green is the area set up by the Mid-Atlantic Council, and that purple stipple is the area uh, developed by the New England Council. These areas uh, affording protection to the marine environment are larger than the state of New York. Um, and I, you know, I think it's really a remarkable act of conservation and evidence that our management partners can work collectively at, at large ecosystem scales. Uh, getting to the end of this list of inspiration, you know, we are able to change our mind and adjust our perspectives. In that Spencer Baird, you know, 88 questions, you know, one of his questions was, what is the effect of pollution on uh, fish species and fisheries? And that, that topic had a lot of effort uh, in the 1970s, and that effort uh, diminished some. Um, but there is excellent region, reason or urgency to bring this back into our, our portfolio, into our ecosystem portfolio. On the work on the West Coast, um, finding that tire-derived chemicals uh, cause, you know, kill salmon in rivers. Um, so that's a, you know, direct evidence of a contaminant killing salmon, an urgent issue. Um, we need to understand the population level effects of that. Um, and then another paper which I was involved in, uh, sort of going through a review of river herring science uh, in support of species conservation, you know, really uh, drove home the point that it's the, the dams on rivers that are the biggest threat to river herring. And we really should be focusing our efforts there uh, to support conservation um, and restoration. So really thinking about how do we rebuild coastal fisheries, um, the answer may not be uh, fishing or regulating fishing. So there are many more examples in the Northeast um, and many more examples across the nation. Uh, but I take inspiration from these examples as, you know, these are the incremental steps that we need to take to be successful. Um, so now I just want to lay out, you know, some next steps for, for me um, and hopefully they're useful for all of you. Um, the picture is my dog sitting in front of a sign that says formerly the sign that indicated the end of the world. Um, and the idea is, is that I think we can see a way towards being, uh, giving ourselves an A at ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, we can now see past this sign and I'll talk about, you know, how I see us uh, taking some steps to get there. One, uh, just sort of setting the stage, you know, there's a lot of terms, ecosystem approaches to fisheries management, ecosystem-based fisheries management, ecosystem-based management, 
ecosystem-based approaches to manage. Each one of these is you know, technically different um, with different definitions, but they all call for us to widen our lens and take an ecosystem view of the problem that we are trying to address. So let's remember that we need to be taking that broad ecosystem view to our problem. It's in our mission, uh, in our mission statement, ecosystem-based approaches to management, and it's in our history. Spencer Baird laid it out uh, in 1873 in his first report to Congress. Setting the stage, um, you know, arguably uh, these ecosystem approaches uh, at one point in time were thought of as nice to do. Um, adding, uh, you know, value to a system which is working well, uh, you know, maybe decreasing some uncertainty increasing the precision of estimates. Um, but I, I hope we all now feel that there are urgent uh, drivers requiring us to take an ecosystem perspective. Uh, offshore wind as one urgent driver, climate change as a second urgent driver, these conflicts between protected species and fisheries as a third urgent driver. And so the way I've you know, sort of thought about framing this shift is you know, we used to think of ecosystem approaches as nice to do, um, but I think now the evidence is clear that ecosystem approaches are must do's for us. Um, third, you know, we, we do need to recognize that taking that ecosystem view is a wicked problem. It's complex, uh, there's contradictory information, uh, we're never gonna have complete information and the landscape is always changing. So recognizing that it is a wicked problem, we're accepting that it is a wicked problem, we need to avoid the two traps. One is inaction because it's such a complex problem, and two is thinking that somewhere out there is the answer that will solve the problem for us. So keep those two traps in mind. And then, as I said before, um, we need to sort of keep you know, our wide view, the ecosystem, and we need to keep our detailed view, um, in this case, uh, river herring maturity. And so we need to be able to work across those scales from details to ecosystem, um, either individually, uh, team-based, or organizationally. We need to be able to do both. Um, so then, okay, let's think about what's, what are our next steps. So we need to take a step that avoids trap one, um, but we don't try to do it all in one step that avoids trap two. And then taking our lessons, uh, we need to use what we have. We need to be inclusive and participatory. We need to be respectful and we need to be willing to learn. Um, and so I know that that, you know, are not the most, uh, concrete findings of a scientific talk, um, but for me, those are uh, what I, where I see uh, our next steps to addressing this problem of ecosystem-based fisheries management, implementing ecosystem-based fisheries management. So it, it largely comes down to a reframing of our, of our goal statement. Uh, from my perspective, we should not frame our goal as implement ecosystem-based fisheries management, because that is a wicked problem. Um, we should reframe our goal as working together to make progress on implementing ecosystem-based fisheries management uh, and thereby defining it as an incremental problem with direction and committing to work together on it. Um, so I'm gonna end, I've got just uh, you know, four quotes here. Again, this is, you know, these ideas are not new um, and they're not unique to ecosystem-based management, nor are they unique to sciences. Margaret Mead, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, is the only thing that ever has. Nelson Mandela, one of the things I learned when I was negotiating was that until I changed myself, I could not change others. Michael Jordan, talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. And Parveen Riemann, once you rise up horizontally, you take everyone with you. But if you want to rise vertically, then you will rise, but then there will be no one there for you. Um, so again, you know, trying to frame 
you know, our approach to ecosystem-based management more as a, our perspective on it, not simply the tools that we need to solve it. Um, so I just want to thank, I've, you know, learn and take inspiration from all of you, all the work that is done across NOAA. Thank you. Um, in particular, everyone who works at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office, the New England Council, Mid-Atlantic Council, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, our Atlantic Species Review Group, uh, Cooperative Institute for North Atlantic Region, North Atlantic Regional Team, and more. Uh, that, it's that collective effort which will help us continue to make progress on ecosystem-based fisheries management. This issue is still tangled in my mind, um, but one benefit of giving this seminar has helped me realize that you know, this problem is always going to be tangled. There is no clean solution to it. Uh, we need to work in that complexity, um, work together, and take incremental steps. Um, so then, you know, last question, and I can uh, happy to answer questions, Katie, from you as people respond here. You know, what next step can you take working with someone else to make progress on implementing ecosystem approaches to fisheries management, ecosystem-based fisheries management, ecosystem-based management, and or ecosystem-based approaches to management. So what next step can you take working with someone else to make progress on implementing this ecosystem view in what we are doing uh, for living marine resource management? So happy to take any questions, Katie, um, and we'll let some answers roll in here. So thank you. Awesome, John. Thank you so much. This was a very enlightening talk. So we're going to get through questions and I'll remind everyone that if you do want to participate in the poll, that poll information is in the chat box. And if you do have a question, put that into the question panel or the question box. So I'm going to kick off this first question. How do you see NOAA's integrated ecosystem assessment and the effort to advance EBFM fitting into current fisheries priorities? I mean, I mean, obviously fitting into is sort of coming from the assumption that it may not. Um, it's clearly in our mission statement that uh, sound, backed by sound science and an ecosystem-based approach to management. Um, so the integrated ecosystem assessment program is, is one it's a you know a process or a tool um, that is being used in, in in many regions as a way to you know iteratively develop ecosystem information uh, to inform fisheries and other assessments. And so it, it's a, it's an essential piece of what we are doing and and what we need to do. But I fully recognize you know from that you know what's our grade in uh, in implementing this. You know I think we had somewhere between a B and a C. So you know, call it a B minus or a C plus. So we need to work, uh, we need to put more effort into combining across these efforts, um, understanding the pieces that we have and structuring those pieces in this ecosystem framework. Thanks so much, John. I think I heard a boat in the background. Am I, am I accurate? I think that was a truck. <laughs> it's, hot, it's hot in the office today here. I've got my windows open and the uh, delivery truck just went by. And the boat, you will hear the boat soon. I thought it was the oh. ferry. <laughs> not, not Great. Okay, moving on to our next question. Uh, do you see value in more roles within NOAA for people that bridge the gap between science and policy? If so, how could that capacity be developed? Uh, so yes, um, and there's actually a, an excellent book. Uh, I don't have the title on the top of my tongue. It's called uh, you know, Six Rules for Solving Complex Problems. Um, and so there's six rules. You know, I have some. You know, they're not they're not as clear as my lessons, I don't think. But uh, there are still there are six rules, and and one of the rules is support uh, your integrators. Um, and so that, you know, that's something which, you know, I, I think is key is we have uh, different components to NOAA fisheries, different components to NOAA, different components to our science enterprise. What we need to do is support those people and those roles that integrate across or among or between those components. So yes, very much. Uh, we need to, we really need to be thinking about integrating across the whole. 
So yeah, this uh, you know it's sort of this number eleven here on my screen. Develop actual jobs in NOAA for people who serve as links between policy and science. Well, I'm not quite sure what actual jobs mean. Um, <laughs> I think I have an actual job, but yeah, trying to trying to you know <laughs> basically help people be integrators uh, and sort of have jobs where the, the the primary responsibility is to be integrators. Great, thanks, John. Okay, next question. Um, how can NOAA do more to encourage or inspire councils to prioritize and implement EVFM? I mean, work with them. Uh, you know, it shouldn't be us encouraging councils to implement EVFM. It should be us working in partnership with councils to implement EVFM. Again, you know, a number of the examples uh, that I gave uh, were council actions, the, the deep sea coral habitat protection area, council actions, the, the management strategy evaluation leading to changes in harvest control rules. I think it's really coming, really approaching that relationship as a, as a collaborative partnership, not NOAA fisheries trying to, you know, have councils do something that NOAA fisheries wants. It comes down to that working together, define your next steps together, and then take those next steps together. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question is, climate change and implementing an ecosystem view across many organization requires a high degree of coordination. Uh, our asker is wondering about your perspective on data integration, fishery dependent, independent, and model products. What are we, what are you or we doing well and what could we improve on? It's interesting because I think, and you know, we've been talking about this you know, somewhat at science boards. So I'm Northeast Fishery Science Center Director. I sit on science board, uh, which is all the science center directors and uh, director of office science and technology, and then director of scientific programs. Uh, so that fisheries modernization, data modernization effort is something which is being led out of office of science and technology. That's key to our success. Uh, but again, kind of going back to the history, right? Because you, you, you have to understand, you know, it's that inertia problem. You have to understand where you've come from to understand the direction that you're currently taking. Um, I, you know, I think there's a good argument to say that NOAA Fisheries developed as a regional organization uh, with, you know, sort of a headquarters, you know, uh, cap, as it were. Uh, you know, a lot of the strength was in the regional relationships between a science center, regional office, and Fisheries Management Council. Um, I think we are all appreciating um, the need to coordinate and integrate more at the national level. So, you know, the fishery independent data in the Northeast is, is largely separate from the fishery independent data from the Southeast, largely separate from the fishery independent data in other regions. And I think there have been some excellent steps recently, the DISMAP effort out of uh, Office of Science and Technology, which is combining trawl survey data sets from across the regions and presenting a national view. I think that's an ex excellent example, um, and I think we need to do more of that. We really need to be thinking about our data as a national data collected and used in the regions, not regional data collected and used in the regions. Great, thank you. We're going to grab a couple more questions here. Uh, Incremental change assumes time to progress incrementally. Do you have a recommendations on how best to support integrators when it feels like the time is up? It's interesting that, you know, that time is up, or, you know, that came up with the, the paper that I published. One of the reviewers said, you know, we no longer have time for an incremental approach. Um, it's like, well, we've been you know, trying to solve this for 150 years and we've been trying, you know, one could argue not, you know, we need to sort of take this different model of how to how to do science to support public policy. Um, so you know, I think particularly when I look through those examples in the Northeast, I think we're quickly building momentum. Um, so yeah, we have urgent problems to face, uh, but I still think the two traps of a wicked problem are there. There is no one solution, um, and we have to move. We can't just sort of not move because it's complex. And so I think the the incremental approach provides a path forward, uh, you can be successful and then build on that success and gain momentum. So, you know, I understand the problems that we face are urgent um, and we need, uh, you know, some solutions quickly. 
Um, but I do think working together and incrementally um, is the is the right approach. Thanks, John. Two more last questions. Uh, do you see any EBFM policy windows of opportunity on the horizon that is to create uh, new EBFM policies or legislation? I mean, the, well, policies, we, you know, we have a, an EBFM policy. Um, you know, I read through this before this talk, and I, you know, I think the policy is, is sound. Um, and so you know, I think where our challenge has been, as we saw in that when we graded ourselves, has been in implementing that policy. So I think we need to just uh, continue to commit ourselves to do what we've already said we're going to do. Um, in terms of legislation, you know, the, that's the, you know, you think about it, well, we can't do EBFM until we have new legislation. I mean, that's, you know, it's effectively a Hail Mary um, without sending any receivers downfield. Um, you're relying on a, you know, a, another body to, to develop the, the rules and laws by which you're going to act by. Um, you know, A, that's the, the politics of it are, are difficult to imagine it would happen. Um, and B, I think Magnuson was, is, and, and the Marine Mammal Protection Act both have sort of participatory components to it. I think, I think they have the right idea of how to manage these resources. And I, I think if we understand the value in those structures and really try to work with those, I think we have all, from my perspective, I think we have all the room we need to, to, to implement EBFM and EBM. Awesome, we're gonna grab one last question here. Are there any opportunities to learn how to communicate better with managers? As scientists, we are trained in jargony paper writing, but not with folks who can make change. Well, you know, are there any opportunities to learn? I think, you know, uh, there's always opportunity to learn. So I learned that this poll EV thing in Google Slides works. Uh, I didn't know it was going to. Uh, obviously, that's a very small you know, learning experience. Um, you know, there are, you know, we talked about it, the other, you know, there are communications training, uh, you know, uh, the Office of Communication and NOAA Fisheries does do communication training, uh, trying to work with scientists. Um, there's also third-party communication training. Um, so, yeah, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to learn. You know, I think it's important, you know, identify that that's something that you want to work on, um, and not to sound too, like, technical bureaucratic-y, but you know, communicate that to your supervisor. Um, and we can certainly at Northeast Fishery Science Center you know, level, um, and I also talk about it at Science Board, trying to make those opportunities more widely available. So yes, we need to, we need to learn how to communicate to different audiences, to different stakeholders. Great, great questions. Uh, we did have an attendee who uh, helps scientists communicate with non-scientists. And so I put their um, their little blurb into the chat if you wanted to check that out. But I am going to save all the questions we didn't hit. I believe there was one or two that we didn't get. I'm going to save those for uh, John to answer offline. And I'm gonna turn it over to Peg to give a quick reminder on that next uh, seminar. Yes, thank you so much, Don. Excellent presentation, really very thoughtful. And thank you again. Uh, appreciate all your support, Katie. And uh, again, this presentation, uh, I think is gonna get a lot of hits on YouTube. So uh, look for it on YouTube. And if you have uh, friends and colleagues that were unable to join us today, please make sure you uh, share that link on YouTube with them that the uh, NOAA Library offers. Again, thank you and join us again on November 9th uh, for Kevin Craig and Tom Kelson from our Southeast Fisheries Science Center, who's going to actually talk about what one of the components that John just mentioned, the their ecosystem status report for that region. So I look forward to seeing you all and hearing from all of you. Uh, and again, any suggestions and thoughts about future topics, please uh, let me know. Peg.brady at NOAA.gov. And thank you again, everyone. Thanks, John. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, Peg. And thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Yes, Bye -bye. thank you all. Uh, take care, take, uh, stay safe out there, and happy Wednesday to everyone. Yeah.